Empire. Hey, babies and babies and babies. Hi, everyone. Oh, Cal lost his phone already. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. What's up? What's going on? on? How how you doing after yesterday's doubleheader, man? (laughs) I'm going to rethink that one in the future. (laughs) Cal. I mean, to be fair, I don't think we saw a 4-1 spirit game coming. So (laughs) that was the other part about that. No. Yeah, no. Uh, it was fun to do. I, For those who don't know what we're talking about, um, I called the Spirit, well, Callow was there too, Spirit-Kansas City match at 12, and then called the Commander's preseason finale at 8. Um, and it's not just calling the games, like, we had extended pregame shows. <laughs> and I was talking to Mike Tirico and Josh Harris before the game. So um, you might hear it in my voice today. And I'll tell the, the uh, back background over the last couple of days so i don't know what's going on with my voice i've had like this happened to me last year once where it just went out for like a week um and it started happening i started to get this feeling that it was going to happen like wednesday and so i just went on full throat spray throat drops tea like reading on the internet what to do about sore throat like i didn't (laughs) feel sick like i never felt sick at any point in time so I've deduced it's probably like an allergy. I actually read that like sometimes your allergies can affect your vocal cords this way. So that's what I thought it was. So I started taking allergy medications, all sorts of things. And I did this for three days, hoping that I wouldn't have to tell anybody that I'm concerned. And by Saturday night, I was concerned and called you and was like, look, I don't know. I'm just telling you, Mike Minnick, who's in the booth with us, I'm like, you might have to call the game. I'm just telling you. And then I called CJ and I told him and I go, I don't know. Like this happened last year. We had a game where my voice was out and I'm like, I don't want to do that again. And so I just want to warn you. So we fire drilled Jackson up from Virginia beach <laughs> to sit in the booth with me last night, just in case. And then I felt terrible because I did both of the games. It <laughs> sounded fine. And yeah. I didn't need him to do that. So actually, I felt bad that I made Jackson drive all the way up here. I just get him some beer. He'll be fine. Yeah. He'll just, he'll take that as a uh, repayment there. But I mean, was, uh, yeah, I owe him one. I owe him one big time because he doesn't live around here anymore. And he drove all the way up on the just in case. Now, he does the post game show anyway. Sure. So he was going to be here. So what I mean, he was going to be on the air anyway, but he didn't have to be here. So I felt. <laughs> felt bad about that so i owe jack a big apology so if he needs me to do 18 free appearances on his show in virginia Beach, <laughs> <I fail. laughs> there you go exactly exactly uh as for the game last night i won't spend a ton of time on it because they started nobody you know like they they really didn't play anybody um i, I will say like new england did at least on offense new england did because they have a quarterback race going on um, so, um, so we got a chance to see the backup defensive players go against, you know, largely a starting offense and they needed a few penalties to probably really help them last night, but they stood up to it. And I'll, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit more later. So I want to stay on the commanders, but I thought Drake may look pretty good actually seeing him in person. He actually yeah. looked pretty good. Uh, but overall, the thing that really stood out to me, at least from the game, um, outside of a couple players that I'll bring up in a minute was like this is spreading like the this whole this team is into it like they're jumping up and down the sideline trace mcsorley is trucking cornerbacks in the fourth quarter they're going crazy on the sideline this happened last week in miami too and a couple guys made a couple plays they're going nuts on the sideline over it happened in the first week when tress way ran down and made a tackle on a punt um and they're going crazy on the sideline and so i think it's the thing like i actually like this whole you're going to like the way we play. We're going to be very together. We're going to be in it for each other. You know, we're going to play really hard. I'm seeing it. Like I'm seeing it in games that don't even matter. I'm seeing it early here. No, I mean, I think once again, this, this stems from the off season too. Like I think this started with John Allen and Terry and and Duran when they were saying, Oh, like this is completely changed. And I think we were waiting to see what that vibe was going to be. Well, now I think this is what we've gotten. It's that, it's literally everybody 
cheering on everybody. No one's really like taking plays off, even if you're on the sideline. I'm I, I shouldn't say I'm I'm not surprised because it sounds like there's a reason why Dan Quinn won, you know, getting this coaching job, right? We were all kind of wondering because he wasn't the sexiest pick in the world. It's now becoming apparent this is exactly what he told ownership that he wanted to do and help change the culture. I would just yeah. say this. I'm shocked it's happened already like this. Like you can really tell it's been different literally since the first day he's been in. Yeah. I'm surprised just because I think with us, we've been kind of traumatized of like, oh, it's all going to change. And then it, it never changes. And this time around, it seems like it finally has. The other day, the last practice of training camp was Friday. They were not in pads. It was like a walkthrough. But the walkthrough was Dan Quinn. I've never seen anything like this. It was actually really cool. Uh, Dan Quinn was on a microphone like announcing situations and all of them were like 14 seconds left one time out ball at the 42 yard line go. And then like 17 seconds left, two timeouts left ball at R 48 go. And then he'd let it play out. And then they like, and he was just like on the mic talking them through the whole thing. And everybody was into it. Like typically like a Friday walk through end of camp, everybody was totally into it. And I'm seeing this over and over and over. So his reputation has carried over here. Players like playing for him. Now, you know, we're going to see what happens over the next couple of days because they have a lot of decisions to make. So it's going to be very difficult, very difficult di couple of days. But like when they say this is the hardest part of my job, I actually believe it from him. You know, like I actually believe it that he has relationships with these people and they're playing really hard for him and the competition's really high. And there's even guys like Phil Mathis last night who as of a couple of weeks ago, we're sitting there going, I don't know if he's going to make the team. It's going to we're just put him on the list of bad Rivera picks. Like all that stuff is going to start happening. And even he was making plays last night and jumping around and acting like a kid on the field after he makes a couple of plays. And you start to go, well, maybe he's going to make the team now. Like it's really carried over to everybody. And it's, it's, it's nice to see off of last year where, God, we were flatlined, you know, at this point going into the season. I mean, I think back to this now and I'm like, I don't know how we were 2-0, and honestly, considering what was going on. No, uh, I'm with you. And, and you know what? I don't know what the what the messaging was to the team beforehand, but you could also tell as well, they truly – everyone always says this, like, oh, make sure you show up that last preseason game because you never know who's going to be watching, right? Like, that's always the – stereotypical coach speak and what all the players want to say last night. It actually seemed that way that like, even if it Aaron Mathis doesn't make the team, he left 110% out there and some other yeah. team's going to see, Oh, that guy looks pretty good. Like to me, I got the vibe. They actually were going out there and saying, no matter what happens, we're all good with each other. And then hopefully we all get picked up somewhere else. Yeah. I'll get back to all that stuff in a minute. I want to do a couple of the top line things um, that occurred. Chris Collinsworth goes on the air and says, Jaden Daniels is going to be a superstar. He uses the words superstar. So I saw Mike Tirico, who's actually on the pregame show with us yesterday. I know Mike from my days at ESPN. He's great. And he was talking to us actually a lot about Jaden because he said, you know, I called the Notre Dame games. Um, so I know Brian Kelly. So he said, I talked to him, you know, regularly. And I talked to him a lot before the draft. And he went on and on and on about the work ethic of Jaden Daniels and all that stuff. But that's what you would expect from his coach. You would how did, how did Brian say, Kelly sound, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> I can't do it today. You're asking me to, I can't do I'm off the impressions today. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm fighting it still. So I'm off the impressions today. The adrenaline's gone. So like now that like, I can't even do the, I, I'd like to do a Paul for that Georgia Tech coach too, but I can't do it. Can't <laughs> Run do the dang either. ball, Paul. <laughs> that guy was amazing. That's my new favorite college. Coach. I'm a big Georgia Tech fan now to that guy. I, I love that dude. Anyway, so Tariko's like going on and on about him. I saw college worth of Tariko at the Friday practice. They were having their production meetings. They got Jaden Daniels. Tariko was telling me off the air on and on and on about how he goes, this guy sounds different to me. Like I get it. I know I like, I've seen it all. He was going on and on about him. Obviously his, you know, his abilities are, you know, are obvious. You can watch it. And then Adam Peters was talking to Collinsworth for a while on Friday. So you know, I don't know if the rubber stamp of approval from Collinsworth means anything to anybody, but he was pretty effusive. I didn't see it, but I heard about it, and he was pretty effusive about it, that they're, they're like, they got it right this time. They really did. No, I mean, it doesn't mean nothing when he says someone's going to be a superstar. And obviously when he says that, like you said, he's been speaking with people around the team. He's been hanging out a bunch. 
I'm not surprised here, but once again, I feel like Commanders fans, for the most part, are all very much will believe it when we see it. We have been peddled this for 20 plus years, and I'm I agree this one's probably different, but I think we're all in the wait and see mode 100 percent for for them. Yeah, I mean, this is I think the the only other time, but he has the second overall pick. I mean, you should have the hype. I mean, like sure. that, that goes with the territory of it. And the last time we had this was RG three because I think even with Haskins as a first round pick. The whole thing after it happened was even people on the inside of the organization didn't believe he should have been picked that high. <laughs> right, right. All right, so that's not a good way to start. If you're trying to build a hype train, that's not a good way to start. With RG3, Heisman Trophy winner, crazy athlete, number two overall pick, then did come out of the gates and looked incredible. You know, like dual threat, came out of the, what, what, that New Orleans, game I, I remember sitting there <laughs> we found our quarterback for the first time in my lifetime and i'm hoping we get that in tampa in a couple weeks and i'm hoping we have a very different thread line than rg3s afterwards with Jaden. but you know i i, I don't want to i've also been very been trying to be careful uh, um and not get too far ahead of myself i also have seen it all i also know that the organization has gone out of its way to like not push that too hard but every day looks better um, the other day he did one of those behind the back passes like Mahomes in practice. Um, he, he seems very cool, calm, collected. He seems pass first, which I like. He seems to know the offense. And while we didn't get to see him last night, you know, hearing Chris say that and all this guy does is, you know, watch football <laughs> all day long was I also, I like hearing it too, but I'm like, again, like, I don't like, it's like how much stock it, I don't know. Is this Warren Buffett picking a stock for me? I don't know. Like it's, it feels a little bit like that. I think the uh, other comparison, because you mentioned RG three there too, is that I don't think a lot of people are talking about is in both cases with RG three and Jaden, they were both overshadowed by clear cut number one guys that had been like preordained for a couple of years, both in luck and in Caleb Williams case too. And so I think what's always funny about this is when we have these types of drafts, unless you're the team that got that guy, the rest of the fans in the league, I'm not saying they don't know anything about Jaden, but for the most part, they're going, oh, well, he was the first overall pick. How good could he be? And instead yeah. you have Caleb Williams and Andrew Luck overshadowing those guys basically from the get-go. And so it's actually kind of, I think it's helpful for both of them in, in this case that it was like, oh, we don't really know what we have. And then when you find out, you're like, oh my God, this is actually someone that's legit. And in RG3's yeah. case, yeah, it happened right away, but it fizzled out pretty fast. I mean, we have two weeks to talk about it, but like, what are we unleashing in Tampa? I don't know. I don't really actually think I've seen it. Both sides of the ball. I really don't think I've seen it. Yeah. We have Bobby Wagner on the game broadcast last night. And what you guys are going to do on defense, and he immediately said no. <laughs> so like, they're not really showing us you know like a lot of the guys like alan payne wagner they never played a snap in the preseason you know when i watch practice there's a million times i think i've said this over the last five weeks like they're not showing us anything i, I don't know what they're going to be I, I really don't i think when the doors are closed it's very different so i am very very hopeful that Jaden's fast-tracked into a spot where they feel really good about him this defense is can't be worse it's going to be better can be like considerably better than what it was i actually think they're very strong up the middle we'll see if that plays out to be true but i think they are um i don't know i, I still see the same weaknesses but can they fool tampa enough to pull off an upset you know in week one because they don't know what's coming and how could they possibly have any film on this like even when i talked to london and logan on the broadcast they're like i don't think we've seen what they're going to do so they're trying to stay as under the radar and unknown, at least through the first couple of weeks. Then they have tape on you and it's too late and it's out there. But if it steals you a win or two early with a young new team like this, it could start the type of momentum that we saw on the sideline last night. Because the reality is like, they're all going to be in it for the team and psyched and pumped and going at it when you're competitive, which Look at their schedule here. Three of the first four on the road, four of the first six on the road. A couple of them are Cincinnati, a West Coast trip, Baltimore. It's a very tough schedule. Tampa Bay, who I buy as a candidate to repeat as a division winner this year. Like, I buy that totally. I think this is a very hard schedule that they're starting with, and most of it's on the road. So, 
they're going to have to steal something here or there to try to, I think, get through it till they get around to the home part of the schedule. Well, I don't think they're hiding it either. Like we've basically heard it not directly, but alluded to, and we've talked about it tons of tons of times here is that they're clearly going to try to run the ball first. Like they're not going to have Jaden like lead on Jaden early. At least that's what it feels like. Like Cliff has gone out of his way to say, I really like Robinson. I really like Eckler. and I really want to get the run game going. I think what what he's basically alluding to is they're going to try to keep these games close early on and then use Jaden to win them. Like, I think this is kind of like the formula they're going to do in the first month of the season, or at least first two weeks of the season. And then we're going to see what Jaden can do. But I think what he's what he's kind of alluded to is like, they're not going to try to make it too hard on him right away. And I think it's going to be a lot of run the dang ball with this team in the first couple of weeks, just to, just, just to just to get Jaden like acclimated to this. And I think that's perfectly okay. I got to tell you, like, the more and more and more I think about the Dotson trade, and I think it's more complicated than this, but like, because, you know, obviously there was something off between either he and the team or was it his confidence? Was it his physical play down the field? Was it all of it? You know, like, did they just feel like they might as well get an asset for him, especially if they're just going to not play him a lot, which is what seemed to be what it was heading towards. But there's also this part of me that goes, you know, This team using two tight ends, two running backs, 21, 22 personnel. It doesn't really actually feel that off to me. Everyone keeps talking about air raid and they just picture this four wide receiver set. Jaden Daniels chucking it all over the field. I don't know about that. Like, is that going to be part of the arsenal? Sure. Like in the same way, are they going to use his legs and have design runs? Of course they are. Like, why wouldn't they? But I don't think it's going to be a feature of what they do. And more and more and more, I look at this and I'm like, I could see them running the ball a lot or having Eckler and Robinson on the field a lot and putting Eckler in the slot or running him in motion or having him come out of the backfield and then handing it off. Like, I actually think this might be a more simpler run the ball offense, at least initially than people think. And I think, I don't think that's the bottom line on the Dotson trade. Like, well, you know, we're only going to use two receivers most of the time. But I do think it's part of it. I think I think it's a tell a little bit, maybe, that like they do intend to use two running backs, two tight ends more often. And therefore, when's he even going to get on the field? You know, right. if he hasn't emerged as an obvious number two, he's not going to be a physical receiver down the field, which they really value and want. And they get out of guys like Deami Brown, Terry McLaurin, et cetera. Well, if he's not going to play a lot and we don't intend to spread the field and try to run some spread offense, well, then maybe we ought to get something for him and get an asset back. This also just plays into what this coaching staff has done the whole time, and that's use the players to the best of their abilities and the scheme, right? So they could have also looked at this early at the personnel and gone, there's not enough wide receivers to run that air raid offense. Let's pivot over to a more run style with Jaden, who can open that up. And we'll go ahead and sign Austin Eckler, where he doesn't have to be the starter here. And then there's Brian Robinson, who looks really good. Like They could have very well just gone, this is what we've got to run right now because this is just the personnel that we had. That wouldn't surprise me either. This just seems like a smarter group than in the past. Yeah, I, I just I look at it too and I go, you're going to run some four wide receiver set and you don't have any real burners outside of Terry. Like, what do we really? Yep. Are you like, you know, like, so I, I, I agree. I think that they're assessing what they have um, and I don't think that they can play that style. And, you know, maybe listen, do you come out for a series to try to change things up and do it because you trust Jade? You try to get the ball out fast. Sure. You know, like, okay. Like, and you throw people like Eckler in the slot or you throw Zacchaeus in the slot, maybe McCaffrey. Like, okay. Like I'll buy that and I'll see it, but I don't think that's their offense. It doesn't feel like that's what will be their offense. But again, like, I don't know. Like, like they haven't really showed us what they're going to do. So I don't really know what they're going to be until we get out to Tampa. It could also be the the more dangerous thing for them is we'd rather have Ertz and Sinnott out there than Terry, Brown, um, uh, Dotson, and McCaffrey or insert wide receiver four. You know what I mean? Like they might just say we're better off with the two tight ends because it gives us way more options to run the ball. And they like what they've seen from both of those tight ends to actually catch the ball. I got to tell you too, a bunch of empty backfields with the tackle situation on this team also – feels risky to me and like i i don't know like i don't think wiley's had the best summer but i've been all along going i'm willing to have a redo with him because i thought the scheme was part of the problem 
So I want to get a redo with him. But they may, on week one, put a rookie tackle out there, maybe, as a starter who didn't play a single snap in the preseason because he got hurt. And they may not. They may choose to go with Lucas because they just feel that's a steadier situation. But at some point, he's going to walk out there. You picture empty sets with that? I like. I I don't like. I, I don't think they're going to put themselves in that kind of danger. Personally, no, I agree one hundred percent. And I, once again, I think it's just those that that set gives them more options all the way around: protection, passing, running, everything. I think that's why we're going to see a lot of heavier sets. Uh, I do want to go back to last night for a moment because Trace McSorley, we called him the MVP <laughs> on the broadcast last night. <laughs> Two fourth quarter touchdown drives. Um, he's from Ashburn. He's openly admitted like, you know, it's very cool to put on this jersey, you know, having grown up here. Uh, he was there for what, two days when he had the play, you know, in the Miami game. and had a chance actually to win at the end. And Boy, did he take advantage of it. He trucked a corner. Everybody went crazy <laughs> over it. He led a couple of touchdown drives. He all of a sudden gave life to Martavis Bryant to potentially make the team because of the number of the plays of, that he made in the fourth quarter. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But just I'm just giving the flowers to the hometown kid who, let's be fair, is probably not going to be on the team as of tomorrow because when we look at the quarterback situation that's in front of him. But – you know, as someone who gets to call the games of my hometown team and know what that feels like, not that Trace McSorley hasn't been in the NFL, been on a number of teams already and was drafted in the whole thing. So he's already had that kind of dream. There must have been something really cool for him last night to actually lead a fourth quarter win wearing that jersey last night. No, I mean, if there was one like positive takeaway from last night, I mean, not one, but like the best takeaway from last night, it was definitely watching him and his scrambling like right off the bat was like, oh, he's he's go like he's treating this as a legitimate game once I start once I saw him take off for that first one in the third quarter I was kind of thinking oh he's gonna definitely like do some damage here and then he trucked that cornerback so no it was a great story so you want to talk about Bryant for a minute here sure so when they signed him I didn't think anything of it this is pre the Dotson trade I didn't think anything of it I'm like you know what he's a bigger taller different athletic profile than anything they have on the team So, and he used to be really good, but that was a long time ago. Uh, And he's bounced around for a lot of reasons. We don't need to revisit here. There's a lot of reasons why his career went the way it went. And it's been six years since he played in a regular season game, but he was in Dallas last year. He was on their practice squad. He never got called up, but Quinn knew him, you know, and they worked him out in the spring and they didn't sign him. So that kind of weighs in my feelings about where this goes from here because I think if they felt like there was a big arrow pointing up I think they would have brought him in in the spring but they didn't and now they get to the summer and they bring him in anyway and he was really good last time he's had a lot of really good plays albeit at the end of games with all third string players and all that stuff and he should dominate something like that this is a guy who you know for a couple seasons up in Pittsburgh looked like a pro bowler so You know, he should dominate people like this, but had a touchdown catch on a slant last night, had a seal block on the other touchdown that occurred the week before when there was a late interception. He caused the fumble from the corner to get the ball back to give them a final chance. And I will go back to they have no one else on their receiving core that looks like him at his size and athleticism. And so. I'm going with there's like a 20 percent chance now that he is going to make the team. I am more inclined to believe that you just put them on the practice squad because you can, and I don't see any reason not to, and just keep playing with them. And if an injury occurs or something, bring them up and see what happens. But I'm going with, it's about a 20% chance now because there's no one else on the roster that, that fits his profile at all. No, you, uh, you said exactly what I was going to say. He's a practice squad player, bare minimum. I mean, and if another team picks him up, good for him, but there's no way I think you kind of let him go. And to, to your point too, not only did he, you know, have that effort at the end of games. He caused that fumble too. And I'm kind of thinking, all right, the guy's motor is clearly still there. Like that's actually really impressive to me because I think you and I have seen it a million times over where you sign the veteran guy for training camp and see what you've got. And you never really see an effort like this. Like they do okay a lot of times, but this is one where I actually really like his effort. I feel like he actually, he, he, he knows how important this chance is. And we've just seen him take advantage of every chance pretty much. Yeah, I thought Quinn, I don't know if you heard him last night, but really, like, 
spoke eloquently about him saying how happy everybody is and described it as like, you know, as players and people in this league, everybody's journey is very different. And his obviously is very rocky. He could have had a very different career, um, but he's still here and he's still going at it. He could have quit a million times. And I think they appreciate that. There's something, I mean, that is the quality that Quinn really admires is the effort, desire, enthusiasm, never quit, play hard. And, you know, we'll see if he rewards that with an actual roster spot. I still feel like that's unlikely, but off of what I've seen the last few weeks on this test run with him, I would put him on the practice squad for sure and see how it goes. Now, like, I don't know a lot about him and I don't know a lot about his history, but considering what we know and why his career got derailed, the idea that it lasts any period of time is probably something the organization wants to see. But if he hits certain benchmarks in that regard, then I could see a incredible comeback story that could materialize at some point this season. No. And also I think these wide receivers there remind me of the offensive line a little bit in terms of an actual unit. Like there's, the clear cut one is Terry, right? And then it's Brown, but we don't know how that's going to shake out across 17 weeks of games, right? Like we're going to see different looks. Someone's going to get hurt. I think it opens the door for him somewhere down the line, as long as he keeps this effort up during practice. And yeah. The season. And, and on Diami, like he's like a number two per se. I think they've been like, but I, and I agree. Like, I think we need to see it in terms of the playmaking. What they like about him is he's a very physical, willing participant player. And they want their guys to block down the field and they trust him that way. I think it's why he emerged to the level he did. I think he's capable of making these plays. And until he gets the opportunity over and over and over, we're going to find out if he does that. But I need to see that part to believe it. But I know what he is in the physical part of the game, which is why he emerged the way he did. All right, we'll take a quick break. Cuts are coming tomorrow. We'll talk about it next. Brand Watch the Show, ESPN 630, the Sports Capital. All right, welcome back. Brad watch the show ESPN 630, the sports capital. Uh, cuts come tomorrow. Don't think there's a tremendous amount of decisions to make, really. Um, the list of players who did not play last night was very, very long. And even Dan Quinn smiled when asked, is that an acknowledgement of the people who are going to make the team? And I think his answer was, you're barking up the right tree. So does that mean now that Dotson's gone, Crowder's the punt returner, even though that they wanted to give Kaz Allen chance after chance after chance after chance, probably because he didn't suit up last night. So I am now guessing that Jamison Crowder is going to make the team be on it as the fifth or sixth receiver because he's the punt returner. And on the other side of that, I think they've given Kaz Allen 8 million chances to pop something. He hasn't done it. I don't know if that ultimately matter i don't know if it comes down to you had to do something in one of these games to definitively get a roster spot but he didn't so i'm not sure where that's going to land with him tomorrow yeah i mean i'm not surprised it's going to be crowder i think this kind of even goes back into last year's you know um, decision on signing him was when in doubt sign the veteran that's going to catch the ball and get you a few yards and I think Crowder is fine for doing that. Plus, we know he can play a little wide receiver with the state of the wide receiver room. Kaz Allen, I think, if they had a good enough wide receiver room, would be a luxury. Like, he would be a guy that you put on the practice squad or put on one of those last roster spots and you try to, like, coach him up and be a be a gadget guy. But they don't have that luxury with the way the wide receiver room looks and the way the running back room looks right now. Yeah, I mean, they – so they've done this with a couple of players – They've moved them positionally because I think they're feeling a squeeze in position groups and they feel like there's an opening somewhere else. So they started calling Kaz Allen a running back and working him at the running back room because I think they feel like there's a spot there. And I'll get into that in a second. There is. Like, so I don't, like, in fact, so much so that I wouldn't be shocked that after cuts from around the league, they may look at a veteran running back if they feel like there's an upgrade there behind Robinson and Eckler. Like that wouldn't actually surprise me if they go in that direction because none of the players there have emerged in a way that it's like obvious that that person has to be the number three running back. Michael Wiley has some burst. So does Allen. They've worked him back there. 
He also has this prolific, you know, record from high school where he basically was a running back. But, you know, this is one of those situations where he's probably fastest guy on the field. So he gets out in the, you know, gets out in the open field. No one's ever catching him. That's not what's going to be the case here. Um, They have described him like Debo, not in build, obviously, but to move him around the field. So they have a lot of hope in him. But are they trying to convince themselves that they've got something there? And that may be what's happening right now. I think bare minimum, he's a practice squad player because I know that they like him and it doesn't mean they couldn't give him an opportunity at a later date. But as it stands right now, I just haven't seen the type of explosiveness. And I also feel like this also to me is an acknowledgement that they know they don't have a lot of explosive players. So they're just looking for it. They're trying to find people who could provide it. Kaz Allen could provide it. Wiley could provide it. So one of those two, if not both, are probably going to make the team if for no other reason they're looking for spark plugs because they have a lot of very good players. Robinson, Eckler, I think McLaurin could make big plays, but no one's saying he's Tyreek Hill. And then you look at the rest of the team and you go, Ertz isn't beating you downfield, but I like him. Sid, it's not killing you downfield, I don't think, but you like him. You know, Diami here and there. McCaffrey's probably not a downfield threat. Robinson... He ain't busting off Jameer Gibbs runs, but he's probably going to have a big season for them. But it's going to happen at the five to 10 yards a clip type of thing. They need explosive play. I think it's an acknowledgement. They, they don't have explosive players, which is why I think they're so hoping and convincing themselves that it's either Wiley Allen or both. No, I think it sounds about right. Like the desperation to get those explosive plays is why this is happening, right? Like I didn't think we'd be in the third preseason game having a whole thing about Kaz Allen, but we are because clearly they know what they lack on the offensive side of the ball and they possibly, re- possibly returning. And it's also, if we get the ball in this guy's hands once or twice a game, maybe he pops one. I do think it's not great though, that last night he got all those chances and didn't really do what they wanted him to do, but he still might make it off of just kind of the desperation that they have. Yeah. Um, so if you go also on the theory that like the guys who weren't playing are mainly safe, or maybe a couple of them are IR because it's the rules different this year. You could put two guys on IR and not have to shelve them for the season. That was a change in the rules this year. So I'll see how they handle the rookie Jordan McGee who can't play right now, but they feel is going to come back. Will they IR him for the season or will they IR him short term? And there's a limited number of guys you can do this with through the season. So it's not as easy a decision as you would think it would be. But if you go on this theory of the guys who didn't play were pretty much safe, And the guys who are out there that, you know, that aren't buried deep on the depth chart are the guys fighting for spots. Then it reopens the conversation about Jamin Davis. Like he was out there, he was playing. Uh, London was basically saying to me on the air last night, you know, look, he just needs reps, like, like reps, 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 like don't read into this differently that he's, you know, that he's fighting for his job. It's more about this transition for him it's just good for him to be on the field and playing in this position more and more and more and more. And that's where he kind of landed on it. But I was skeptical of it because in the end, while I do appreciate what he's doing here, I do appreciate his enthusiasm for it, his desire to do it. The coaches have credited him for that. The reality is they've got to trust him to play at this position. So I'm kind of 50, 50 at this point. I have a feeling like I wouldn't cut him in the same way. I would talk about Jahan Dotson. If they didn't feel like he was getting there, I would try to move him before I would actually cut him. He's a former first round pick. So I don't, I would try to move him first and get an asset back. Um, and then on the other side, do you keep him on the roster and go with him? I mean, I, I feel like it's 50 50 right now for that. I mean, I think he was always going to stick around mainly because when you do keep him, you're going to get that third round compensatory pick. I mean, honestly, that, that was. Unless he was absolutely terrible in training camp and preseason, I always felt they were going to keep him. And I actually think he's been a, you know, kind of a pleasant surprise about how he's played so far, too. I always thought he was going to stick around, mainly because of that. So I guess you have to ask the question, does a team come and want to do a third-round pick for him like they did with Chase last year? Like, that's the only thing I could see. I don't see any team stepping up and doing no, that. I so I think, I, I, I think he's ultimately on the team. I do, too. Um, but I, I 50, 50, if someone comes along with something, because I, that's where I am on it. So we'll see, um, defensive tackle 
Phil Mathis and John Ridgway seemingly are fighting for a spot. Um, cause Alan Payne Newton, who obviously couldn't play in the preseason, but is their second round pick. And obviously he's going to make the team Alan, uh, Mathis or Ridgway. That's another one. Could some team come along with an asset for one of those two? Like, I actually think that would be a good scenario for this team if someone showed up with something of any kind of value at all for either one of them. And I think Adam Peters have to seriously think about it because I don't think they can both make the team. Yeah, no, that's that's one, too. Uh, I look at that, at least with Mathis, he was a second-round pick, so you can actually kind of hype up to somebody, hey, he's got talent, and you can blame a lot of the previous regime on him. So there's got to be a little bit of value there. The same thing, you know, when it ultimately boils down to it, if the season rolls down to one of those two tackles, we're in deep trouble. But no, I think another team, if they are desperate for one of those guys, I think they would be a good move. And then at corner, Sandra still is day one starter in the slot. Um, Forbes is going to make the team. There's, there's no question about it. Forbes, St. Juice, Sandra still, uh, Michael Davis, probably Igbenogany, but he did play last night. That was interesting, but I, I think, so that's, that's five. So if there's a sixth, I think it's Tariq Castro Fields, but is there a surprise at the bottom of that room where Castro Fields beats out somebody? I don't know. So I think that, that one could be a Tuesday surprise, like what that room actually looks like. I think that one is also the prime candidate for, we don't have a name that could finish out the roster that they could be on another team right now. I think that's the prime yes. prime unit that we might, we might not be talking about whoever's going to yeah. be in there week one. Yeah. I said this a week ago and I still believe it now. And Quinn even hinted at it last night. I think there are three to five players that are on other teams right now. They're going to end up being on this team over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, it's not just after cutdown day, you can make a couple moves after week one teams, you know, have to kind of maneuver their roster a little bit to try to protect a couple of players. And then they make a couple of cuts. So, I really wouldn't actually be surprised if, if uh, I, Quinn said it best. He goes, you know, we're second in the waiver wire. And he goes, I hope we're never there again, but we might as well take advantage of it while we're here. Yeah. So I think we're three to five players. Corner is a room I would watch. Running back is a room I would watch. Receiver, obviously offensive line. If some surprise happens out there that somebody of value actually gets put out on the open market, I think that's a possibility. All of them are in, in question. And then the last one I'll just bring up that I'm, I'm wondering about is safety. So they, you know, because it's very crowded, they moved Dominic Hampton, the uh, the fifth round pick to linebacker, I think, to try to make room for him because the safety room is very crowded with Quan and Chin as the obvious starters. Percy Butler, who I'm assuming is going to make the team. Jeremy Reeves, who I think is in a battle to make the team. Um, and Derek Forrest. And then Tyler Owens really emerged, and I'm just having a hard time buying that they're not going to keep him the way they've talked about him and profiled him. So Derek Forrest and Jeremy Reeves are two names that I'm watching very closely here. And you know, I, I God, I I can't see a scenario by which they they release Derek Forrest, but there may not be room. So I think that's an interesting one to watch tomorrow. It's definitely an interesting one too, because I thought he was going to be one of the guys that really thrived in this scheme. Like he's always been, he's, he's one of those guys that has always flown around. Like even when they were not good and you know, there's not as much enthusiasm. He was always one of the guys that always like had it turned on. That's probably one of the more surprising, you know, ones of this entire training camp is that we haven't just heard about him a little bit more. I thought he would be one of the names they talk about often. Yeah, he missed a lot of camp early with a hamstring injury. He was coming off that shul- bad shoulder injury from a year ago. But I was like, when these guys were hired, I'm like, oh, they're going to love him. I'm like, yeah, he's fast, hits hard. He's a missile. They're going to love him. And it just hasn't been there. So he's one I'm watching pretty closely tomorrow as well. All right, let me take a quick break. Graham wants to show you ESPN 630 Sports Capital. Welcome back. Very much to show ESPN 630, the sports capital. One quick football thing that I just can't let go over the weekend. Um, Trey Lance can never be Dallas a starter, right? I mean, <laughs> whoever's fever dreams of we don't have to pay Dak because we have Trey Lance, that has to be over now, right? <laughs> There's five picks in a preseason game. That has to be over now. Yeah, but he had that long touchdown run. Come on. Uh, yeah, yeah. He looked great. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it was ever realistic. I think... They want to see what they that had. Was a, I didn't. I, that was a. I don't know what I don't know because remember he hadn't really played down there, and it was like 
all right, he's a really high draft pick. He's a great athlete, like second chance, let's see. And then they gave him the whole game in the third preseason game. And some of the interceptions were ridiculous too, like absolutely ridiculous. Uh, he might have played himself off that roster. I mean, this is, we've ran into this a couple of times with Dallas where remember you and I have like yelled and screamed who's playing behind Dak yeah. like in multiple years. If you're Dallas, why are you not getting another veteran in there? Because you Cooper have Rush. a ton. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you have enough talent that a veteran could step in and be fine. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I think he, he might have played himself off that roster. One other quick one, too, before I forget about it. Drake May has to be New England starter, right? He, looks he good. made one play last night where I went, oh, man. Well, well, well. <laughs> like, it's looking like the top three quarterbacks are all looking really good right now. He's really emerged over. Remember the the story early in their camp was he's looked terrible and Brissett's definitively the starter. I mean, I know it was a short sample last night, but there's no way that in the middle of the second quarter, New England Twitter wasn't saying, uh, we know who our starting quarterback is. It's well, especially obvious. especially if Brissett's hurt hurt, right? He's gonna have to play. If Brissett is actually like not gonna be able to good to go for week one, then yeah, he's definitely gonna play. I also think if you're Drake May, all you heard in this draft was, oh, yeah, you got to sit for a year, you know, to be a good starter. I'm uh-huh. sure he took all of this to heart and probably studying his ass off every single night to make sure that he was getting better. So good for him. I mean, he's definitely bucked the trend a little bit. All right. A couple non-football items before I go today. Uh, Dylan Cruz is coming up for the yes. Nets. So we get this. The future is now Dylan Cruz, James Wood together. We get to see them together. Uh, what do you make of that? All right, so I got I got a two-parter here. One, second time this year the Nats have done the advanced call-up. As in, hey, we're calling this guy up, but it's going to be on Monday. Great. I'm <laughs> so glad. Like, it gives people a chance to come see these guys right. for their first game. I- I'm just saying, when you suck and you're not going to make the playoffs, these are the only things we have to look forward to as fans. This is entertainment. You need to cater to the fans and explain to them you're doing these things. And I, I explain it all the time. I-, I love the Orioles. I love that they're our partner, but I explain this to you. They called up Adley Rushman on Preakness Saturday morning. Like, no one up no one up there was going to that game. Like, that was, that's a disaster. So, kudos to the right on. <laughs> Like, kudos to the Nats. For doing they didn't that call right up Rushman. Right. You're drunk at the prison. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, they're probably they probably did. Look, it's right here on my phone, there, Han. <laughs> right. So, kudos to the Nats for doing that right, because I, I, I feel like I need to point that out. Number two, I'm just gonna throw a theory out there. They decided we're not gonna bring Dylan Cruz down to Atlanta. We're gonna call him up on Monday. Who do the Nats play tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday? The Yankees. Who's a free agent on the Yankees coming uh. up this year? And they go to Juan Soto. Hey, you see Cruz out there. You see Woods out there. You could be the third outfielder. You get to be the guy that anchors all of these young guys now. Is this Rizzo and the learners kind of going, hey, man, if we if we match up on money, this could be the lineup that you slide into. You think they're him $600 million? I think they could. Have you seen what they have to pay on their payroll next year? Mm-hmm. It's like, because no joke. Corbin's gone. They're like, now we can give somebody $600 million? Their payroll next year, the only numbers that are in before arbitration kicks in is $40 million. They're spending nothing on their roster next year. They could sign Juan Soto and still only have a $100 million payroll. So wow. they like, I mean, if this happens, I said this on my show on Friday. If they were to sign Juan Soto and convince him to come back here, Mike Rizzo is a Hall of Fame executive. He goes into the Baseball Hall of Fame, I think. Mm. Uh, Soto, by the way, said uh, to Yankees fans, talk to Brian Cashman if you want <laughs> me back here. Did you hear that one? Did you see that one? <laughs> That's Direct good. Quote. I, didn't, I didn't see that. Talk to That's Brian good. Cashman if you want me back here, which I liked. He's a Rizzo uh, client. He's a Rizzo client. He's going to hit free agency. I, this is this is malpractice that I spent this Monday show without talking about the Sean Taylor installation. <laughs> but I've run out of time, so I promise I will do it tomorrow, and I will weigh in on it. Then, <laughs> spoiler, they're doing the right thing. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about that tomorrow. But one thing before we go, because we did the spirit match yesterday. So, as of midweek last week, because there were five Olympians on the spirit, four of them played on the U.S. team that won the gold medal. Gabby Carl played for the Canadian team. The four U.S. Olympians, Hal Hirschfeld, who was an alternate and didn't play, was going to play against Kansas City. Just two of the top three teams in the NWSL resuming play, right? 
The other three were all question marks, and it was pretty certain that Trinity Rodman and Casey Kruger were not playing. Then all of a sudden, like out of the blue, they put them in the lineup. They, they were like shot out of a cannon, and they just leapfrogged the second-place team, who was a prolific scoring team that they completely shut down. They dominated them. And I'm starting to get a funny feeling here that under this new coach with these new players that they've brought in and the way they looked off of a break, having together, that they're extremely dangerous. And like we might be calling a championship season. I'm pretty excited about what's going on here. I think uh, you hit it on the head there. All these things are really exciting. But when your top players who weren't supposed to play all week decide they're going to go and play against that team in Kansas City, the rest of the team fell in line and was like, okay, we're not going to lose this game. You know how sports are, man. That's one of those moments that like makes a locker room really like come together. And as you said, they have all these new players that also were great yesterday. And you had Paige Mateer score one of the best goals we've seen all year go end to end, essentially on a new position. All of the storylines for the spirit had a lot of question marks heading into the second, second uh, half of the season. And they were all answered, and they looked even better yeah. than they did before. It's exciting. It's exciting. They did. They looked great. They won 4-1 to one against Kansas City. And then our next broadcast is in a couple of weeks. We'll take on Portland back uh, at Audi Field. All right. That'll do it for today. Talk to you tomorrow. Brand Blessed Show, ESPN 630 Sports Cat.